Dr. Art Hall is the executive director of the Brandmeier Center for Applied Economics at KU, uh, where he's also uh, has a teaching role there. He has his PhD from Emory University, has worked with the Sebelius administration previously, Coke uh, Companies Public Sector, he's worked with the Tax Foundation, the Government Accountability Office, and countless other uh, credentials uh, that you all can read about in the bio or uh, find on that machine that you are now going to silence um, that you have in your pocket so that it's not ringing during the presentation. So with that, Dr. Hall, take it away. Thank you so much and good evening. So I have... Um, Two big takeaways, or two broad takeaways, uh, that I'd like to share with you tonight. The first takeaway relates to the process of economic development. How does it work? And I'd like to sort of go through that uh, to topic using information relevant for Wichita. The second uh, broad takeaway relates to the efforts uh, related to the redevelopment of downtown Wichita. I've done a little bit of research and I want to share that research and hopefully it will offer a, a perspective on how to think about those efforts. Now my, my, my presentation kind of assumes that a picture is worth a thousand words but if you can't see the picture that doesn't help much but we'll do our best and I see happily that you have, uh, you have the slides. All right, so what I want to try to do is tell a story in pictures here. And so our first picture is this map of the U.S., and you'll see that it's titled Taxpayer Migration. So what you're seeing is essentially a measurement over about a decade time span of the patterns of taxpayer migration. By taxpayer, I mean people who filled out a tax return, right? So I'm using IRS data to measure how people move around the country. And... We want, I don't want to spend too much time on this. If you're looking at the picture, the easiest way to think about it is the dark blue spots are the counties that have the most out-migration. The red spots are the counties that have the most in-migration. And the takeaway for us, of course, is all of the Great Plains are dark blue, going all the way through the Great Plains. And so the idea of... So, obviously, Kansas is a part of the Great Plains. They're caught up in this mega trend. All right? Now, I want to sort of be clear. Um, it's not like there's a mass exodus. Every one of these counties is experiencing people coming in. It's just more people are leaving. And this is happening persistently. In fact, uh, an email just came across my box uh, yesterday. Uh, one, of the, one of the moving companies, I think it's United Van Lines, um, at the end of the year, I think they do it as free publicity, but they measure the states where the most people came into and the most states where uh, people left. And, and unfortunately, Kansas made the top five of people leaving. But this is not a new phenomenon. It's actually been occurring for decades. And again, it's not people rushing out. It's just a slow leakage. Now, Kansas population is growing. So the population so far has been growing enough to keep us growing, but people still seem to leave. All right. But the takeaway for us is... This, oh, this broad swath, excuse me. Oh, all right, I'll get the hang of it here. So the broad swath of blue. All right, God, damn it. all right, sorry. All right, I'm not going to play around anymore. Okay, so now what I want to do is show you a picture that actually looks at taxpayer migration in and out of Sedgwick County. All right, so the way to read this is um, the dark red bars here, or dark green here, are all of the people who left Sedgwick County but went to somewhere else in the state. The purple bars, uh, I'm sorry, the, the green bars are people who came into Sedgwick County from somewhere else in the state. The purple bars are people who left Sedgwick County but went, went to somewhere else in the state. All right, now what's interesting is if you peel that back, most of the, the people who are migrating within the state are really just going to Butler County or Harvey County or Sumner County, and that essentially defines statistically the Wichita metro area. The biggest leakage, if you wanted to point to one county, is people leaving Sedgwick County and going to Johnson County. 
All right, but generally speaking, the, the in and out migration around Wichita is really not people leaving Wichita. They're just moving to a different county, you know, and Butler County being the top destination. The, the more interesting ones are here where people have left Sedgwick County, uh, come into Sedgwick County from another state, and here they've left Sedgwick County to go to another state. There is no obvious pattern to this, but the, when people leave or come, it tends to either be from Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona, or Colorado, all right? But there's no distinct pattern at all. Now, what's important to take away from here is people are coming to Wichita from other states. Now, people are leaving faster, so if you take the last few years, about 1,400 taxpayers, so we can think of that as households, perhaps, 1,400 tax, uh, taxpayers are leaving the city of Wichita, and that's kicked up quite a bit uh, in the la last few years. All right, so that's a trend we would obviously want to reverse, but the good news is people are coming in. So it's not like this dire thing. You have to just come up with a reason to flip, right? So instead of accretion out, you get accretion in. Okay, now I want to show you this map because what a, a point I should have mentioned with the, the out-migration of the Great Plains, it's, you can interpret it not as an out-migration in many ways, but as a regionalization. And it really goes all the way back to the, um, the Homestead Act of 1862. Just lots and lots of people came out to the Great Plains, they were making farms, and so all of that population slowly but surely is losing what was the foundation, the economic foundation for them being here. And so they're either leaving or we're collapsing. All right, now what, what I want to do with this map is, is basically show a time capsule type picture but in a two-dimensional way. Okay, so if you look at, um, does that help or hurt? Yeah, could we? I don't James, do you know how that happened? No, actually, I don't. Okay. <laughs> we'll get it sort of okay, all right, we'll keep rolling here. All right, hopefully you can see the map. All right, so what the shaded counties on the map demonstrate are counties where over time, over the last 60 years or so, the share of population, the share of state population has grown. All right, so this is what I'm trying to show you in terms of where is the regionalization happening. And as you can see, it's Sedgwick County and Butler County and Geary County, and then, of course, the Kansas City metro area. So the way this works as an experiment is to say, all right, from 19, so I'm using census data, and I say from 1950 to 2010, did the county increase its share of the state population? And then I said, so it's a test, it's a statistical test. Then I say, okay, let's do a new test. From 1990 to 2000, did they increase their share? If the answer is yes, then they stay in the game. And then from 2000 to 2010, did they increase their share? So you can see, big, narrower, narrower. So I, this idea of momentum. So you get the idea of where people are going, and that's it. And then the stars count counties in which there is actual population growth. And the population growth test is, did the population grow from 1990 to 2010? Yes. And then did it also grow from 2000 to 2010? Yes. If, if those things are both true, you get a star. All right? So what you can see is lots and lots of depopulation across the state. But um, the more important point to point out is that these, these uh, state is regionalizing and it's regionalizing around these shaded areas. Now, interestingly, it's been a while since 2010, so if I use 2018 to create a fourth category and I did the same test, Butler County would no longer be shaded and Geary County would no longer be shaded and almost all of those stars would disappear. So we're not going in the right direction, but from an understanding what's going on uh, point of view, we're regionalizing, and uh, Wichita is part of that process. Okay, now I want to jump to the basic employment trends. We could, there's so many trends you could follow, but employment seems the simplest one and it tells a, a, a story that we want to we want to track. All right, so what you're looking at here is the white line is the United States, and then the red line is Wichita. 
okay, the Wichita metro area, and it's just, they're, they're, we're, they're, we're tracking the trends of employment. So from 1969 all the way up until the late 90s, you can see, generally speaking, Wichita is keeping up. But then, right around 1998, we get this flat line here. But then we start growing, and it can be deceptive the way these lines work. So this is really the flat line, but then Wichita starts growing again here. And then Wichita, just like the nation, goes into the recession in 2008. But the nation comes out of the recession very hot, and Wichita has been lagging. And I think that's probably the discussion you've been hearing in the news. Now, I, I want to go a little deeper into that because I think this lays the foundation for the history that I want to show. So I've, I've broken the trend, hopefully you can see this, into two parts. So the top two lines relate to um, wage and salary employment, all right? And then the bottom two lines relate to self-employed people. So I took that last chart and I broke it into two, into the two components, wage and salary, employment, self-employment. And it tells a much richer story. So if you look at the, so here is the United States wage and salary employment, this line, and then here is Wichita, this red line right here. Now notice this is the early 1980s, so all of this flat line here is the 80s. So we had a very bad recession in 82, as you all may recall. Okay, do we have oil and gas people in the room? Okay, well, the flat line basically relates to the ag sector and the oil and gas sector. That was a very bad decade. And as you know, those are important industries. And then once you had a bad, a bad decade with the oil and gas industry, that rippled through to the construction industry and the finance industry. And so what we did is we lost a lot of ground here. But notice, after that, once you start getting into the 90s, we, we start growing again. And then we actually grow pretty well through the recession of the, of, uh, um, the 90s and the 2001. But we're just not growing nearly as fast as the nation. But we're growing. Now, contrast that with self-employment. We're tracking the nation all the way up into 98, and then we completely flatline from 98 to, to now. All right? Now, that, once again, is this got started by the oil, uh, the oil and gas industry, but then you can really see a hit here in the 2008 recession. And I think one of the things that you'll hear talked about is Many other metro areas our size are growing. They're rebounding faster out of the Great Recession, and we are not. And I think one of the explanations for that is that when we got hit with these, the 2001 recession was very much an aircraft recession, and then the 2008 hit everybody. But I believe the 2008 recession really cut into muscle. And uh, so we're, we just, we're really growing from a much lower base and a much weaker position. That doesn't mean we can't recover. I'm just offering that up as an explanation for why we're not rebounding as fast. That doesn't mean we won't eventually catch up. Okay, another one of these charts. This, to me, we're now going, the next two charts are what I think are some of the most important information when you're thinking about the process of economic development, okay? I will lay out my basic process after studying this stuff for so long, I've come to the conclusion that basically economic development is nothing more than a trial and error process. Okay? And it's a trial and error process that happens across the nation. And, and think of yourself as a venture capitalist. There are all these great little businesses out there and you're going to try to invest in one and you have no idea which ones are going to hit. And the best venture capitalists hope that one out of 20 of their investments are going to carry the rest of the losses, right? The point of that is not to compare economic development with venture capital investment, but it's just very much a trial and error process. And it's very easy to think that you can say, go and offer a big incentives to companies and have them come in, for example. But you're no different than a venture capitalist there. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. All right, so I want to at least lay that perspective out. And so what this does is, is very similar to the migration stuff. Uh, this is um, all, what this does is show the employment dynamics of all businesses being created or expanding or contracting or dying in the city of Wichita. All right, so think of 
every business that's starting, and these dark green lines are all the jobs. So look, there's about 10,000 or so, roughly speaking, on average. These are all the jobs that were created in the respective year by brand new businesses starting that year. So there's quite a bit. Then this, the, the light lines up here are the jobs created by businesses that are already here, but they're expanding. Then you go to the bottom, and the purple line is all the jobs that are lost by businesses that are dying. They're just going out of business, okay? And then this, the purple, light purple, lavender lines are all the businesses that are here, but they're contracting. And this is what I mean by a trial and error process. Notice, I'm always impressed by the symmetry, right? And so this white line right here is the line that measures the net employment. This is what you'd read about in the newspaper. But the process behind the net employment line is what's most important for understanding economic development. Every one of these businesses is trying as hard as they can. It's just a, it's, it's hard out there, right? And so um, when, when the, the expanders and the, uh, and the births are outweighing the, the deaths and the ex contractions, you grow, and that's what you want. But this process is always churning, right? And there's no business that's immune to it. All right, so that's the trial and error process idea that I wanted to share with you. Now, the next slide is very busy. <laughs> okay, but it really is where one of the most fascinating uh, facts of economic development in the United States resides. So I'll, I'll try to go through this. Now, I'm using United States data here because it's easier to tell the story. But the same story I'm telling would apply to Wichita, it would apply to the state of Kansas, it would apply to any state. Okay? It's like the DNA of economic development in a market-based economy. That's really what we're looking at here. So here's how the, the chart works. We start the world in 1977. And what we do is we're going to take all of the businesses that are born in 1977 in the United States. And they created 5.8 million, right? Now, this column over here, the, the very, this right column here, is all the businesses that existed before 1977. So we're still capturing those, right? And those businesses collectively lost 1.65 million jobs. Then once you start the clock rolling, now we can start saying how old, so this is one year age, age two, age three, age four, age five, age six through 10, right? And so we're going through time. All right, so we're trying to capture how much jobs are being uh, created on net on net, that's the important part, by all the businesses in, uh, that, that exist from 1977 forward. Now, to make this easy, all of the shaded cells, the blue cells, are positive numbers. All the other cells are negative numbers. So what you can do here is you can say, okay, here is the total net job creation. So you're basically adding up the positive and negative numbers all the way across the row here, and we're saying, here is the net job creation in the United States, and these negative ones are the recession years, right? Now, notice this last column is the kicker. This is the net job creation without age zero firms. If you don't have new firms being created every single year, we are constantly liquidating jobs. That's what we mean by dynamism. That's what we mean by it's a trial and error process. So whenever you're thinking about what do you do to create economic development, what do you do to create prosperity, the answer in one way or another has to be we need more jobs being, we need more firms getting in the game because it's a trial and error process. It's a numbers game. Now notice from the chart before, Notice there's a very high statistical correlation between birth and death, expansion and contraction, right? So you want to be able to get as many people in the game as possible, and of course you don't tell them to get in the game, you set the, the conditions by which they want to get in the game, right? And that's what makes it so very hard. Okay, now what I want to do is add just a little bit of spice to this and that'll wrap up and then and I'll explain it and then we'll, we'll move on to the next topic. So what this chart does is take all 366 metro areas. And what I have on the bottom uh, line here is the percent job growth since from 1990 to 2014. And I stop in 2014 because that's when the data stops, unfortunately. 
And then this is the average job reallocation rate. So remember the chart, how we're expanding in birth and death, right? That's, if you add all that up, that's the reallocation rate. So what you see is a very nice, statistically speaking anyway, from an economic perspective, a very nice positive correlation between the rate of job growth and the rate of turnover. Now here's the hard part. I don't have a good theory of causality for you. I'm not gonna tell you that the growth, the job growth creates the reallocation or that the reallocation creates the job growth. So underneath the hood, what's going on is that for places that are growing have this vibrancy that's encouraging people to get in the game. And when they get in the game, then there's this high correlation between birth and death. But if you're in a place that's growing really rapidly, all of the deaths release the people who can get picked up by the births, right? And so that's the dynamism aspect of it. All right, now I left off one point I wanted to tell you, and this is really an important point. So I'm gonna go back to this slide. What this slide doesn't show you, but which is important, is that um, what is what the key drivers to economic growth in a, in a geographic area or in the United States as a whole are the number of firms, let's just say it this way, the number of firms that go from zero to a billion dollars in revenue in 20 years. And the, the term for these is gazelles, the really fast growing firms. All right, and so even though all of these numbers are negative here in the white, there are some firms that are exploding. So uh, examples uh, in the Kansas City metro area for, would be like Garmin and Cerner. Back in the day, Cessna might have counted. Uh, my favorite example, actually, and, and I think I have the history right, but maybe someone here can correct me, but Pizza Hut. So Pizza Hut started here. And for 10 years, it literally was Pizza Hut, right, on the Wichita campus. And then a couple of investors got together and said, hey, I think we should create a few more of these. Right? And I think they had in mind five to six. <laughs> Within a few years, they had a thousand stores in their New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> that is a gazelle. That's what we mean. You know, how does that happen? Of course, Google and Microsoft, Amazon, those would all count as gazelles. Okay? So what you're trying to do in the numbers game is create a gazelle. But if we could all create gazelles, then you know, all of us would be Jeff Bezos, the richest guy in the world, right? So it's very hard to do. And so, but that's what's going on underneath here, is that you have a process where lots of firms are getting in the game, and then you're getting some, some hot ones, and the, you just have a very vibrant uh, um, economy. Here's the part that I find very strange, or hard to explain. Nobody knows the secret recipe, right? And so, I'm actually, I actually have come to the conclusion that economies grow because they're growing, which is horribly unsatisfying for a scientist, right? So what was the spark? And then a lot of times you really can't trace it out. There's a nice uh, book on Silicon Valley and they trace it all the way back to a very charismatic individual that left MIT and went to Stanford because his mother was sick. And next thing you know, Silicon Valley, right? So that's the kind of nuance that we can be talking about here. All right, last slide on this. Um, the bottom row is the average employees per business in 1990, so the start of our time period. This uh, here is the percent job growth again. All right, what you see is a nice negative correlation, but what that means then is the economies, or let's call them the metro areas that have the the smallest firms on average, the, the businesses with the lowest average employment are, tend to be the fastest growing, okay? Now, of course, what that means is not that we should take all our big businesses and make them small businesses because that's the way you create growth. What's going on is, once again, this is an is um, environment in which lots of businesses are getting going. They're getting in the game. So you'll often hear that small business is the real key to job creation, but that's not quite right. What's right is it's new businesses, and new businesses that turn into gazelles, and new businesses tend to be small. All right, so that's the process. So, that I've, I've, so that's our wrap up. So we are in a situation in which the Great Plains is depopulating, 
It's regionalizing. Wichita is part of that, but unfortunately, Wichita too is slowly losing uh, momentum in terms of population. But if we want to get economic development, really what we have to do is come up with a way that more and more businesses want to start in Wichita, but in a declining industry with lots and lots of big businesses that have a lot of uh, economic power to hire people at high wages, it's a very difficult environment, right? And so, all right, so that concludes part one. I think part one will help inform part two uh, and what you need to think about is this idea that it's all a trial and error process, and I hope that that data uh, convinced you of, of some of that. All right. Uh, I've gotten the five-minute mark, so I may go over a little bit on this. Okay. So I wanted to share with you some research I did on downtown redevelopment in Manhattan, Kansas. And it's a really, it's a pretty quick story, but one of the interesting things is I found when I was doing other research, that Pottawatomie County was always one of the fastest growing counties in Kansas. And what do you think the answer is? It's just Manhattan growing over the county line, just like Butler County or Andover is the reason that Butler County is one of the fastest, or was at one point one of the fastest growing counties. All right, but that sets up for an economist like me, it sets up a nice little statistical test. So just like Wichita, Manhattan is doing its redevelopment and they have a star bond. And so down here at the Starbond, their Starbond project was they created a museum. And they used some of that, that whole project to create new shopping here, new shopping here, and they also created this museum. All right? Now, the reason this triangle over here, so this is downtown Manhattan on, on the left side of uh, Tuttle Creek Boulevard, and then this is Pottawatomie County. Well, this is where all the growth was happening, okay? So then they put in this star bond district, and this is what I want to show you happen. So the blue line, so here is the Pottawatomie side of the road, and it's growing very quickly in jobs. So these are jobs right in, in just that triangle area I showed you from 2002 to the start of the star bond project in 2010. So you can see when you compare it to the downtown Manhattan line on the, uh, you know, on the Riley County side of the line, it's growing faster. And then the Starbond project comes in, and the, the Manhattan, or the Riley County side of the line keeps growing for quite a while, but you can see that the employment tails off on the Pottawatomie side, all right? So essentially what was happening, and this is basically the theme I want to share with Wichita, is you had natural growth, but if you apply enough resources, you can redirect that growth but you're not getting necessarily any net growth. You're just changed where it is. And that is the important thing to at least keep in mind. It doesn't mean it couldn't have created more, but I wanted to share with you a very explicit case in which all it did was rearrange things. And, the quest and you've spent a lot of resources to do that. But on the bright side, they now have a tall grass prairie museum and that's very valuable to somebody, right? I mean, so I can't tell you it was the wrong thing to do. All I'm commenting on is Will it create net growth? And in the, in the Manhattan case, it will not. All right, now I want to go to, to Wichita here. Oh, I, I'm sorry, one, one last slide here. So now what I've done is this red line is the zip code. So what I'm trying to do is say, okay, you've got downtown Manhattan, but downtown Manhattan is in a larger zip code. So what you can see is, hey, downtown Manhattan is tracking the zip code until Starbond. And then Starbond keeps growing or down right half. But look, the zip code is flat. So all you're doing is pulling in businesses from the larger zip code into downtown. That's not bad, but it's not net growth. That's the, that's the point that I want to make, OK? All right, so now what I've done, and, and I'm, I'm working with KPI on a new project, I want to look at Wichita and, and think about similar things. And I haven't done that research yet. But I've carved Wichita up into these quadrants. So here's northeast, you know, southeast, or southwest, excuse me. And then here is, I'm going to use downtown as zip code 67202, which is a pretty good proxy for downtown, if, you know, downtown proper, okay? And so, uh, and then what I'm trying to do is measure the employment in each of these zip codes, and I'm going to break it up into these quadrants so that you can see where the natural flow 
of employment is going in Wichita, just like it was going to Pottawatomie before the Starbond District in Manhattan. Now, anybody want to shout out where you think the employment's going? Is anyone stunned by that? So this is not a big reveal. This is what you know is happening, right? So, but if you look at downtown, which we've defined as just that zip code, this is 1994 here, which is when the data begins. That's as early as I can go. It's about equal, and then you get this steady trend down, and basically all the business is going to the northeast, right? So this is the natural flow of commerce in Wichita. Yes, we're growing slower than we would like, but we're growing, and that growth is seeming to go to the northeast. So the question then becomes, all right, do you want, like Manhattan, to redirect it back downtown? And if so, what's the price you're willing to pay to do that? And what's your end result? Especially if it's not going to result in net growth. And then I'm going to add one thing. So this is, um, this is south northwest, right? So you're still you're getting growth in northwest, too, all right? But it's not downtown. And then I'll just close out. The south doesn't really matter. You don't get a trend there. So that's it. So, so. <laughs> Why don't I, so that's where I'll stop, but, but I'll leave the question to, to tee up the, um, to tee up the uh, Q&A. Why should you spend scarce resources to redirect growth away from its natural channel? There could be very good reasons, but it's a price you have to pay. Lest uh, anybody be confused, we love the people from the South of Philadelphia. <laughs> What Dr. Uh, Paul was saying was more just about the job growth. It's not the small talk down there aren't solving. No, here. correct. Um, so, quick reminder on questions. I have the microphone. I will not be putting it into your hand. Uh, so don't try to grab it from me. Please keep your comments short. Ask them as questions. We're not going to do follow-ups. I'm not going to come back to you a second time uh, unless nobody else is asking questions. But I know that this is an intelligent audience who's wildly curious and wants to ask questions. So, raise your hand high, none of these little sheepish things down here, hold them up high, and I will start working my way around the room. We'll go right up here to start. I just want to ask, do you see opportunity zones as a growth stimulator? If, if opportunity zones would help create new businesses getting in the game, then yes. No, any basic rule of thumb, and you, we have business people all over the room, the lower, the less it costs to start a business, the more likely a business will start. But that doesn't mean that the trial and error process has been resolved. So that would be potentially one approach to helping stimulate growth. Dr. Hall, back here. Hi, so we have a neighborhood plan, a new neighborhood plan in South Wichita, along the Broadway corridor where there are 74 used car lots between Kellogg and 37th Street. Part of that neighborhood plan is no more used car lots. Does it work against job creation then when the planning commission goes against that neighborhood plan and okays the expansion and the addition of used car lots in those areas? You know, see what you've pointed out, they, one of the basic rules of all economics is there's no free lunch. There's always an opportunity cost, right? And this, is, this gets to the, it's a hard question, because if the community doesn't want that type of service in its neighborhood, that, that is a fact, but, but you are giving up a business, right? And so I don't think there's a right answer to that. Uh, you know, you are going to lose a business that wants to be there. But if the neighborhood does not want that type of amenity or, or service, then that's the cost of doing that. From looking at the data that you have here with the map of the United States, your initial slide, looks like Wichita or Sedgwick County did better than most of the other counties in Kansas. Can you identify any specific comparative advantages that Wichita has that gives it a leg up over the other four counties in the state? It's a city. I, I, and I don't mean to be flipped. I, I think it, you're seeing the regionalization. You're going to get it around Manhattan. Any, the universities are always going to be a, an engine. So that's why Ellis, uh, uh, Ellis County or Hayes is still growing. Manhattan is still growing. But Kansas City is booming, as you know, relatively speaking. Wichita is going to hang on. But I, I kind of think the isolation, the geographic isolation of Wichita is part of the challenge. And I, I don't know how you overcome that. But that's part of the challenge. 
Raise, raise your hands high. I saw a couple of more hands, but I've got it. But uh, any other hands besides the one that's behind me? There's one. Okay. How much does landscape in the Northeast movement play into it? As in people have nice yards? <laughs> As in hillier, greener? Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. I have no idea. I would argue, uh, my, my hunch is that this is what I mean by Northeast just started to grow. And because Northeast started to grow, it's growing. And, and the catalyst could have been Rock Road. It could have been some, I, I don't know enough history of the, the region to, to spark that, but I don't know that um, hills were part of the answer. I just don't know. Okay, I have one more question, and there's another one up there. Ma'am? Yep. Thank you for your presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. I love statistics. And one thing I noticed that stands out to me is we've been throwing a lot of star bonds out recently, along with SIDS, which is uh, industrial with 2% taxes for 22 years. TIFs, yeah. BIDs, yeah. Uh, I can't even tell you, IRBs, GOs, just to get riverbank development. And to me, it doesn't make sense because we're throwing money in development that you're showing is going to pull from other areas. I, I think that's the question that all of you have to ask. And, that, and that's the contribution I wanted to make is there's always a trade-off. And the natural flow of commerce is not going downtown, it's going away from downtown. And so, yes, if you throw enough resources, you can redirect it. But now you have no net growth. Maybe you will, but you've paid a very high price for no net growth. All right, I saw a question here. We're still formulating. There's a hand over here. These are going to be our last two for Dr. Hall. There's a, there's a lot of data out there showing that cities that do not invest in the core end up dying. Do you have anything old other than the 10 years that shows when you invest in the core with the star shift like you showed in Manhattan mm -hmm. to where eventually that does pay off? That's a great question. I don't have data there. Um, but much like the, uh, the gentleman asked about the car lot, I am very sympathetic to the idea that if downtown is becoming blighted, or blight is not the right word, but it's, it's uh, deteriorating, it's old, and um, people don't want that to happen. That is a community decision. What an economist can do is say, look, you know, what, that may not generate net growth, but it also, you know, you can make the, the argument that I think a lot of people make, that if you allow it to keep deteriorating, then there, that's definitely not going to help anything. Um, but the question becomes, I don't, I don't have an answer. I, you know. Okay, last question right here. Hi, um, Art. The role of local government compared to what policy we have at the state level, what are, what are you seeing and what, is, it, is it more active on the local government because of what we have at the state level and do those things need to change? I, I, I have clarification, is what more active? Uh, incentive programs. Incentive programs. If you are a local government person and the state's willing to come in and basically pick up the tab for something, that is going to be very attractive to a local government. And, and um, here's a great example. There's a star bond in Johnson County. Uh, it, is, uh, it was an empty lot, but there is absolutely, it's a booming area. And they put in the Natural History Museum, which it's a natural history museum, but if there was any doubt at all that, that that land would have developed in the next five years, there's, there's just no debate. I mean, uh, so what you've done is you've basically underwritten developers to create a project that easily would have been done. The only thing that might not have happened is you would have a history museum. Thank you, Dr. Hall.